1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. others didn't talk much at all about, about what went on during the five months he spent in the jungles of Burma during 1944. But I do remember and will never forget everything that he told me about it. I'm Joe Medvets, the proud son of Joseph Medvets Sr., one of Merrill's Marauders original volunteers, 2nd Battalion, F Company, Green Compact Team, Squad Leader. This documentary is about the remarkable men of the 5307 Composite Unit who fought in extreme conditions in the Pacific Theater, the CBI, China, Burma, India, of World War II. They capture some of the hardships and sufferings, as well as the exploits of this remarkable regiment. It is told by a few of the remaining marauders, all now well into their 90s. Although it was not easy getting my dad to open up about this time in his life, he always had high praise for the Burmese natives who fought alongside them. The Ketchin tribesmen of northern Burma were superb guides, natural jungle fighters, loyal allies, and were able to present the illusion that there were many more marauders than there actually were in combat. The Ketchins were with the 2nd Battalion at Nepumga, where they were surrounded by the enemy. As they were unable to evacuate the wounded, Dad mentioned some of the innovative techniques the medics devised in order to keep the men alive. My dad had all the diseases talked about in the film, but he came home a, a very humble, loving man for the rest of his life. He was an original volunteer, and the reason he did volunteer was that they promised the enrollees that an early out they would get if they did the mission. Well, that never happened. And he also must have been previous to Burma in the Australian and Philippine campaigns because he always talked about you know, fighting with the Aussies. He liked fighting with the Aussies and also the little guys, the Filipinos. But that's all the information I have from my father, but it's been an honor uh, meeting with these fellow marauders and learning all I can about the Merrill's marauders. My name is Gilbert H. Howland. I, uh, at the time of the Marauders, I was a buck sergeant. I had a section of machine guns, and in combat, uh, was trapped on a hill named Nupunga for 11 days. Marvin Boinga, Mason City, Iowa. They wanted uh, volunteers for the horse cavalry. Well, I said, I don't want to go with the horse cavalry. I'll stay here in the truck driving. That evening, a uh, sergeant come in, he says, you will be on the train at 8 in the morning. So I was on the train. My name is Marcus Morellos. I was a uh, first battalion white combat team. I was in heavy weapons, water cooled, heavy machine guns. Uh, I'm Robert E. Pathley C. I uh, was in a communication platoon. I was listed uh, officially in white combat team, uh, but uh, the communication platoon was part of headquarters company, so I spent time between 
both red and white combat mm -hmm. teams of the 1st Battalion. I'm Quentin Waite from Michigan. I got into this outfit accidentally. I didn't want none of this damn blame crap that we went through in New Georgia. I had a buddy that never lost a strike. I had lost several. I think most of you fellas probably got busted one time or another. It seemed to me that in the Marauders, the only ones in there were the ones that got busted. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, I went. The bombing of Pearl Harbor was only one in a series of bold strokes taken by Japan to secure their rapidly expanding empire. Japanese forces also attack Thailand, Malaya, Shanghai, the Philippines, and the Pacific Islands of Guam, Wake Island, and Midway. In the following weeks, they invaded British Borneo, Hong Kong, and Burma, severing a vital supply line to China. With the importance of keeping China in the war, President Franklin D. Roosevelt and Prime Minister Winston Churchill agreed in August of 1943 that a long-range penetration mission into Japanese-occupied Burma was needed. The sole purpose of this American ground unit would be to disrupt Japanese communications, sever supply lines, and cause havoc and confusion with the enemy. Our statistics for the campaign was one to two hundred. One of our men died to two hundred of the Japs. We could sting, but you have to understand that the my territory over there was all hills and lowland. The only place the Japs were was in the lowlands where they could have a road or a railroad or river boats. So we went through the hills and come down out of them hills and disrupted the Japs from what they were doing. Meanwhile, General Joseph Stilwell's Chinese-American force would attempt to reopen the Burma Road, allowing supplies and war material back into China. A call went out for volunteers for a dangerous and hazardous mission. 3,000 soldiers responded. I was uh, one of the 3,000 volunteers. President Roosevelt asked for volunteers to fight the uh, Japanese not part of the world in Burma. The regiment sized unit was officially designated as the 5307th Composite Unit Provisional with the code name Galahad. It later became known as Merrill's Marauders after its commander, Brigadier General Frank Merrill. The 5307th was divided into three battalions, with each battalion split into two combat teams. But in a way, it was a, a out of the three battalions, it was first battalion, second battalion, third battalion. We all had us in, and combat teams, two, two combat teams for a battalion. The men were well trained, physically prepared, and many were jungle combat veterans. As a light infantry assault unit, they would use mule transport for their 60 millimeter mortars, bazookas, ammunition, communications gear, and supplies. In heavy weapons, you carry carbine or 45, but as little as I was, I weigh 115 pounds. I were I carry them one all the time, and up to now I say that that saved my life. Uh, the guy who kept our radios in operation, uh, general duties were like at the end of being on the, uh, on the march from sun up to sundown. It was then time to set up the radios and uh, repair whatever units were destroyed or, or damaged due to enemy action and set up the radio for communication back to the base. 
Because they operated in some of the harshest jungle terrain on earth, heavy artillery support was sacrificed in favor of mobility. The unit thus relied on flexibility, marksmanship, and surprise to outfight a considerably larger Japanese force. The INRU had three squads, and every third day you're at a point, and then you drop back to the rear and move up. Those two units were fighting up, the Japs and the Chinese were fighting up there, and we went around and got involved in a wall of them. As we moved around and going up to their position, a INR platoon of ours captured a supply train with an elephant and killed three Japs. I have never had a, the, any better INR platoon in all the time I was in the, in the service of the United States Army. Our INR platoons saved a lot of our lives because they were always out in front, always the point. And we just came along and got in position. On February 24th, 1944, the 5307th, with an initial strength of 2,750 officers and men, began a history-making march through the enemy-held Himalayan foothills into the jungles of Burma. And it astonished me that we went 800 miles in three months through all that cotton picking country. Their ultimate objective, to capture the strategically important Japanese-held airfield in town of Nichinor, more than 800 miles away. And one of the first things we run into was a river crossing. In order to cross a river, you take your poncho out here, it's about the size of this tabletop. You lay your rifle down in there, your shoes, your clothing, your pack, and you'll bundle it all up and you make a pontoon out of it. And then you jump in the water and you're stark ass naked. And everybody else is. So you get in there and you put your arm around that pontoon and kick your feet and you go across. At times, they were forced to leave the trail and head through the mountains, struggling up steep slopes, hacking a path through dense bamboo thickets, unloading mules so that they could make it through, then transferring their load on to the men. Reliant on infrequent airdrops for resupply and subsisting on K-rations, the marauders were hungry all the time. We used to get uh, C rations. K ration was a luxury. <laughs> K ration was better than the C ration because they had a little borrowed chocolate and things like that. We, we took a break one day, went down into this river and threw grenades in it, pulled up some fish, you know? <laughs> no kidding, we had a big feast there. The only break we ever had. Malaria, scrub typhus, and amoebic dysentery inflicted more casualties on the marauders than did the Japanese. Statistics for the marauders was 80% killed and 20% sick. We turned that around the other way. We had 80% sick and only 20% killed. We had a lot of sickness. In addition to inhospitable terrain, monsoons, contaminated water, leeches, flies, snake bites, exhaustion, and the constant threat of attack, they endured hunger, malnutrition, and disease the people uh, around here probably have no idea how we existed in there. But you had no toilet paper for sure, and you had the running bowels, and then you had all kinds of other diseases. Malaria gets to you to where you don't want to move. You're well, I guess you call it sick, you feel sick. All you want to do is lay down. Leadership, 
loyalty, and the will to survive is all that allowed the Marauders to continue. We had the best officers of any unit in the, in the U.S. Army. We had, uh, uh, it was amazing, we had, the officers knew exactly what to do, they trusted the men, the men trusted the officers, they worked out wonderfully. The ones that were not good to the men didn't get out in front. <laughs> When we went in, we had a captain. He didn't last a week. Then we had a first lieutenant. He didn't last a week. Then we got this second lieutenant, and he stayed with us. We'd have followed him through hell and high water. Okay, I'm out on this trail going back to my unit, and all of a sudden I see the general coming back, you know? And he, what did he do? He asked me it was a good day to have some ice cream. <laughs> yeah, in the middle of the Burma jungle. Operating behind enemy lines, the marauders were able to outflank Japanese forces and cut off major supply roads. At Wallaboom, while under massive artillery attack, they killed more than 800 enemy soldiers and forced the Japanese to withdraw. In contrast, only eight marauders were killed and 37 wounded. There was two engagements that were really bad. The first one was after uh, Wallaboom. The Green Combat Team pulled out of that roadblock, attempted to put in another roadblock in, which we did uh, to stop the Japanese coming up from Kaming. They, uh, came up by truck, and we could hear that noise at night when the tailgate dropped down and the Japs got out of the trucks, moved in, and the next morning they hit us. And they kept coming across, charging. Eventually some of them got into the trenches and they wrestled with the troops there. Uh, when I knew it was real combat was when I heard the bamboo. And when those bullets went through that bamboo, it was pop, 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 pop. You could hear that sound. We fought them all day long there. Eventually, just out of the clear blue, we pulled back. We had to. We needed more ammunition. We needed more food. But we did stop them from moving up the road to reinforce their forces. Blocked the Japs from the main body going down the trail to New Punga, which was the next battle. First time I saw combat was at uh, Wallaboom. Most of the action was a little further north where, they try, where the 3rd Battalion had a roadblock in. But a group tried to bypass around them and tried to cross the ro river where we were. Uh, they uh, charged in a, a group of about 30, 40 men that would then hit the ground while they're firing and the second group would try to come over them. Uh, they probably overran their enemy's position that way, but uh, we had too much firepower for them, and uh, nobody, had, none of the Japanese managed to get across the river. But anyways, there wall of bomb was another out uh, situation. I was with the khaki I and R, and Orange I and R was on the other side of the river. My buddy was with them, and he was the second one killed in uh, Burma. The other time that uh, I was involved in direct action was at uh, Shatazoop. Uh, my group was held in reserve on this side of the river where half of the battalion went across the river and they wound up in a uh, Japanese training area. And then uh, we had just marched like 35 hours uh, uh, continuously to get to our position uh, in a sort of middle of the night. So when the Japanese were getting ready for uh, breakfast and such, you could hear the mess gets going, that's when the group that was on the other side of the river opened up. Uh, we had the only bazooka 
uh, we fired the only bazooka that I know throughout the whole campaign. It was brand new. Nobody really knew how to use it uh, properly. But we set up the bazooka uh, facing the Burma Road on the other side of the river when a convoy of three trucks would come up. So uh, the guy who's had the bazooka on his shoulder, we set it up to, for him to get the first truck. And um, when they got the first truck, got held up the other two trucks and everybody, all the Japanese were jumping out, scattering, and the guys on that side of the river had a, a, a real easy time of picking them off. From a captured enemy map, General Frank Merrill, commander of the Marauders, learned that a large Japanese force, possibly two battalions strong, was planning to move north and attack the flank of the Chinese 22nd Division near Shadusa. General Joe Stilwell, the Allied commander, General Joe Vinegar Stilwell, ordered Merrill to block the trail north of the village of Nepunga and stop the enemy from reaching their objective. Merrill placed the 2nd Battalion on the high ground at Nepunga and deployed the 3rd Battalion to defend an airstrip three miles to the north. Almost immediately, the Japanese began to attack. For the next 10 days, 2nd Battalion was under continuous fire while the 3rd Battalion battled to reopen the trail. And there were 57 Merrill's Marauders killed and over 300 wounded at Nepunga. The general said there will be no more bear running down this trail. You, we want to stop them right here at Nupunga. Eventually what happened, we occupied that perimeter to, to hold there. The Japs surrounded us and we were trapped. But we had a Japanese American with us and he, he understood the language. And at night he would creep over into their positions and find out what they were going to do the next day. Well, that helped us a lot because when they hit, we opened fire on We were ready for them. He even came out and ordered them to charge. But in their language, he ordered them to charge, and they charged right into the gun. Uh, I would shout, give them an order, so that we could ever hear among the you know the uh, noise going on. Tatsugeki ni you know, all the things. Actually, I never gave an order before, but uh, this will work, because that's the way they have been trained. Easter Sunday, they broke through to us. I don't know what battalion it was. It might have been a white or what, but they broke through to us and relieved us. I had got hit by a artillery, so I was out of action for a while there. And I, I was... Uh, evacuated by a Piper Cub at a rice paddy down in the valley. Every wounded marauder was evacuated. The brave pilots of these small Piper Cub evacuation planes would land and take off in very hazardous conditions, removing every seriously wounded marauder one at a time. After Napunga, after we uh, uh, relieved the entrapped 2nd Battalion, uh, they were freed on, on Easter Sunday morning. And uh, I guarantee you, everybody went to communion that day. Uh, it was, <laughs> there, there were no atheists that day. <laughs> on May 17, 1944, they succeeded in capturing North Burma's only all-weather Michinaw airstrip. They accomplished this by defeating the much larger elite 18th Japanese Imperial Guards Division in five major battles and over 30 minor engagements. There was a push on Michinaw to capture Michinaw because they wanted that airfield to land Chinese troops in there and glider planes, which, which eventually took place after we had captured the airfield. First Battalion uh, had walked through the town almost unopposed before we got to the airfield. I, was, I came in the mission off after it was secure, and the first battalion was made up of about 200 original marauders, 
and then the rest of them were replacements. I was evacuated off of Nupunga. 35 of us were flown in to Michinaw because we didn't have any replacements. From when we left Nupunga on the way to Michinaw, uh, I became uh, pretty ill and uh, had to drop out and wound up that there was a force of about 50, 60 men that dropped out from the main column. I went over to Seagraves, had a hospital there, and uh, he had 10 Burmese nurses with him. And he, I went over there one day and I told him I thought I had malaria. And he says, no, he says, go back to your station. A week later I had malaria. On the day that I was relieved from the hospital, still convalescent, I wound up uh, being in court in a group that was sent back to Michigan. I was uh, wounded while at Michigan from uh, one of those Japanese bomber attacks. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they claimed that the bomb, the anti-personnel bombs that the Japanese were dropping, if you got hit in the head, was, one of them was the only way you could get wounded. But I got wounded anyway. So. <laughs> At the end of their successful mission, only 130 officers and men of the original 2,750 were fit for duty. No other American force had marched as far, fought as continuously, or had or displayed such endurance as the swift moving, hard hitting foot soldiers of Merrill's Marauders. Uh, I am thankful that I made it out fine, and I'm thankful for the, still being around after all that hardship. For their accomplishments, the Marauders were awarded the Presidential Unit Citation, awarded by the President in the name of Congress for extraordinary heroism in action. The Marauders also have the extremely rare distinction of having every member of the unit receive the Bronze Star. Today's United States Army Rangers are direct descendants of the Marauders. One night uh, there was a little noise in the bushes and uh, I opened up with a machine gun and it was a water buffalo. To, to top it all, <laughs> I walked the Burma Road, almost barefooted because my jungle boots play out. Earlier, if anybody knew General Merrill, I happened to know his wife. Okay. And anything else you want to say about your... your it's a long story. <laughs> okay, good enough. <laughs>